If you hadn't guessed it, see, they like you already. <laughs> They're just being nice. They're just being nice. Yeah. She's had quite a day um, promoting this, Blood Defense. I am about almost to the end, so I beg Marcia not to give any spoilers tonight. It's really good. We'll get to her writing in a moment. Um, this is your fifth novel. Yes. Your sixth book. Yes. And the last time you were at the Y was a, around that first book of yours. The trial book, without a doubt. Yep. In which we saw that courtroom from your point of view. Right. Um, and I think before we leap back to 1994, 95, I want to ask you about a current case which fascinates me, and that is Bill Cosby. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You can't she blame can't a legal it. correspondent, can you? <laughs> uh, the judge this week, as I think everyone knows, decided that the Cosby case, the criminal case, could proceed um, based upon a deposition that he'd given in a civil proceeding, which had been sealed and another judge released. Um, number one, was that a fair decision? Well, I haven't seen the deposition, so I don't know what was in it, but judging by the news reports, um, probably so. Remember, you know, the standard's very low at a preliminary hearing, and that's the status that they were in. It's just probable cause. So I assume she testified to a lack of consent and to being drugged. And, you and know, he testified to actually having used dr in, in he, his yeah, deposition. He admitted it. He yeah. admitted he drugged her. So, probably, yeah, so I would say it's a probably fair decision to hold him to answer and him set, set him for trial um, because it is such a low standard. It's probable cause, and credibility's not an issue. You know, you take what she says at face value. It, the trial will sort it out. So um, what I'm really interested in is whether or not, as you know, there have been probably 50 other women who have come forward and said in one way or another that Mr. Cosby had assaulted them. Under pattern evidence, are any of those voices going to come in? They may. They very well may. I believe that um, that state has the same rule of evidence that we have in California that you have here in New York, where you have a certain degree of similarity, then it can come in to prove intent. And um, it very well may result in having other instances come in. So you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> so let's get down in it. <clears throat> Take me back. When did you first hear that, that uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and, and Ron Goldman had been murdered? That morning. Um, I was in my office preparing to be alone <laughs> and not go out. I wasn't having any witnesses in. I wasn't going to court. I was just going to work over my case files, and Van Adder called me uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning and said, um, I've got some information. I'm going to go for a search warrant. I need you to tell me if I've got enough. And you said? We, he, he had a ton of evidence. He had enough. To, it was crazy. I'd never heard that much evidence. And so I said, yeah, you're, you're good. <laughs> you're good. How did you get assigned the case? So I was in the special trials unit. Um, that unit was assigned to handle high-profile, complex cases, usually murder cases. Um, so there was only, at that time, four or five of us in the unit. Um, so, and I had handled DNA. I had handled also a domestic violence murder. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> As I, I, it was, it was going to be one of us. <laughs> well, was it a lucky day that it was you? Or an unlucky day in... <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't look back that way because it happened. You know what I mean? I can't change it. No matter what I think of it, if I think of it as lucky or unlucky, and there's parts of both in it, I guess. Um, for the most part, and for many years, it felt very unlucky because I wanted to be a prosecutor, and that's all I wanted to be. I didn't ever want to leave the office, and you know, I really couldn't stay after that trial. So. You know, in that I respect. want you to tell the audience what you did the day the verdict came in. I, I basically walked out. I walked out of the courthouse. And never went back. And I never went back. Yeah. Someone else cleaned out your office. Eventually, I had to, um, I got people in to, to clean it out and put everything in storage. I didn't even want to look at it. No, nothing. But I am jumping ahead of the story. <laughs> We're back on the beginning of all of this. I had, as an anchor at Court TV, um, covered the Robert John Bardo trial. And I remember uh, saying to people at the time, this is the single best courtroom prosecutor I have ever seen in my life. Oh, thank you. It was a magnificent, painful, horrible trial. Terrible. 
just encapsulate for those people who don't know what, what had what happened. happened. So Rebecca Schaefer was a young actress on the brink of stardom. She was just about to hit it big. She was in a sitcom called My Sister Sam with Pam Dodder. And she was a lovely, charming, wonderful girl. Everybody that I spoke to only talked about how wonderful she was. Not one bad word. Very unusual to have that happen. And um, Robert John Bardo was a, a fan. Um, one of the bad kind of fans, and people were not hip to that back then. They weren't aware of the dangers of stalkers. We didn't even call them that. This is like 1991. Yeah, exactly. And we called them fans. No one knew. He showed up at her studio where she was taping with candy and a teddy bear, and, and the security guard thought he was just a besotted fan and drove him back to the train station and said, now, son, get on with your life. This man wound up um, paying a private eye $25 to get her um, address. Explain and how he did it, because it changed, this case changed the law in California. Right. How did he do it? He went, he, he hired a private eye, paid him $25, and said, I want you to find Rebecca Schaefer. And so he called the motor vehicles department, right? Yeah, and the, the private eye did. The private eye called the DMV and got her address, and Bardo showed up at her house and, and killed her. Shot her at the door. Yeah. Because she hadn't responded to some missive that he had sent her, and he'd thought that, that you know, when he brought the teddy bear, that she should love him back. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching Robert John Bardo sat in the courtroom and slowly peeled all the skin from his fingers and made a little pile on the table. And he'd pick his face. Yeah. yeah. So he was convicted. Yeah, he was convicted. There, there, it was a mental defense. They were looking to make it seem as though it was a second-degree murder, kind of an impulse killing, that he, he really meant to love her, and he meant to just say something and then accidentally or, or impulsively shot her. And um, I proved through the use of his interview with the shrink that it was actually premeditated and it was a lying-in-wait ambush murder. Park Dietz. Park Dietz it? was his Exactly right. Exactly right. So he's now in prison for life without... Okay, so you know how we are as journalists. I've set you up, so now yeah. I've got to punch you. Here we go. You were the best prosecutor I'd ever seen in a courtroom, so what went wrong in the Simpson trial? <sighs> <laughs> we're going to be here a long time. <laughs> They're ready. <laughs> so, you know, right from the, in the very, very beginning of the case, there was so much evidence there was a blood trail, before he even came back from Chicago, there was a blood trail leading from Bundy into his bedroom at Rockingham. There was the glove that matched the Bundy glove at Rockingham. With blood was, on it, right? With blood on it, yes. Uh, there were bloody shoe prints in the Bronco, blood on the, on the door handle of the Bronco. Shoe, shoe prints, about a size, his size, I can't remember now, 12? 11, Bruno 11. Mollies. Bruno Mollies. Uh, and, and blood drops to the left. Notes, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> blood drops to the left of the Bruno Mollies. Um, and then he shows up with a cut on his left hand. I mean, good, good God. But within five days of, of getting the case, um, a friend of mine who was working in Compton, which is a very um, African American uh, heavy community, uh, came to me and said, This is a loser. You're going to lose this case. They don't like this case. No one wants to believe it. I'm telling you, you're toast. Um, and so, uh, I, I gotta say, um, we knew we were always up against it in downtown Los Angeles. This was a very common thing. I'd been trying cases town for 10 years in downtown LA, and it, race was always an issue. There was a profound mistrust among the African American community of the law enforcement, and every time we had a black defendant, we were going to be facing, we did face, um, what we call the race card, which I don't like it because it's a pejorative, and it kind of is dismissive of the fact that there's a really good reason for the mistrust that they had, but we were always faced with the argument, look, you know, I know you're right, there are bad cops, but this time, not this time, was kind of an, a, a standard thing that we'd have to say. So with Simpson, it was gonna be an issue, and we knew that, but how big an issue was really the question, because after all, this was not somebody who was underprivileged. This was somebody who was more than a member of, of the high society, white society, certainly not someone who had ever been mistreated by the police. In fact, they loved him. They were his adoring fans. So how, how, how hard could they play that card? That I didn't know um, until the, the uh, story came out about Furman planting the glove. And we were seeing that they were believing it. It was being bought and it was being believed all over town, even though 
it was very, very plain. Furman had no opportunity to do it. He wasn't there. A million cops were on the scene before he was and saw only one glove, so there was nothing for him to move. And last of all, logically speaking, he's going to move a glove before he knows that Simpson has an airtight alibi, or somebody else comes in and confesses, or somebody else has, is, you know, an eyewitness knows who did it. That would be crazy. And Furman didn't have it in for him. He let him go. When Nicole made the call and Furman was, uh, uh, Simpson had bashed in the windshield of her car while she was sitting in the driver's seat, Furman was the one who responded to the call and cut him loose. So, you know, how was it was going to sell, why it was selling, it was very clear that it did sell. It didn't matter. It's important for those of us who weren't in Los Angeles at the time that this is also happening in the context yes. of the Rodney King beating. Which Everything was, got worse. So ex it, talk a little bit about the context. Yeah. So the Rodney King case was uh, four or five police officers who beat um, Rodney King. I'm sure you know about that. And they caught it on videotape. And the beating was horrifying, horrifying to watch. And our office prosecuted the cops. Um, but it was an all-white jury in the bedroom community of Simi Valley, where a lot of police officers lived. And they, and they famously acquitted all of the officers. Even though there was a videotape. On video, you know, really, that was the most stunning thing. It was a stunning defeat, um, and it, it sparked riots, the most violent riots of that century. The city was literally burning. I remember I was working downtown, and they were arresting people in droves, and we were doing overtime to process the cases. So in the wake of that, so it was just two years later when we were trying the Simpson case. When so it was proof in a lot of people's minds, both black and white, that you couldn't, if it, black people couldn't get a fair trial, right. couldn't get a fair shake with the exactly. cops. Exactly. So then you get Mark Furman. Perfect. He was the, you know, it, it couldn't Doing have been. Doing what I can to help you, know? you here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, could it have been any worse? I just don't, I don't, <laughs> that was, that's really the question that I kept asking myself every day. You know, what else? But then I But did you feel you know. that way? I mean, because you were cool as a cucumber in the courtroom. But I mean, yeah. inside, were you like mm -hmm. going, are you kidding me? Yeah. That, and that, that is, I think, what was so amazing to me about Sarah Paulson in the miniseries. She was showing you how I was feeling. You know, I don't know how she did that, but. Well, you, it, 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 it's really interesting. About halfway through the, the taping of that, Sarah Paulson and you actually met. Yeah. It was actually more than halfway, so Almost. And it, yeah, and it, it, we, it was great. We had dinner and. Well, let's you know. all right. So I didn't mean to jump out of there. there. I didn't. Well, but you all want to know about Sarah Paulson and the miniseries, right? <laughs> Hold the thought about Furman because we're going to definitely come back to that. <laughs> but okay, so I mean, it is as if this trial that 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 you live through and I live through and about four rows behind you uh, has come back. Yep. Not only with the FX series, the, the series in which Sarah Paulson plays Marsha, but also with this ESPN documentary, eight-hour documentary. Right. Um, before it all aired, were you biting your fingernails going, are you kidding me? I'm going to have to live this again? Yeah, I was miserable. Miserable at the thought of having to, you know, it, it, for me, I, didn't, I, I was hoping not to even see it. I kept hoping it wouldn't happen. Because, um, you know, in Hollywood, a lot of things do get canceled. They, they don't go. You know how that is. And so, but... Um, no, it did go, um, and I think because Ryan Murphy picked it up, uh, but I didn't know how it was going to be played, and it was, the thought of it was very, very painful. And then I heard Sarah Paulson was going to play me, and the honor of that, because I think she's a genius, I thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool. And then they actually started airing it, and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to watch it. I really, I didn't think I was. You know, a part of me was like, I don't think I can stand it, and then I just had to. You know? Well, wouldn't you be honest? I, I mean, if see. someone's playing you on television, you've got to see look. what happens. So, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I'm, I know Sarah a bit, and I, I, I asked her about playing you. She said that when she met you, the first thing you said to her was, <gasps> "Sorry about the hair." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she wasn't too happy about oh, that. Oh, she yeah. was not happy. <laughs> um, but. But on a, I gotta go to my Sarah Paulson questions here. They're further in. Um, what does it feel like? It's an experience most of us will never have to have someone playing us on television. It is so surreal. It's 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 weird. It's so I, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't have the words. It's, it's kind of out of body. And I would watch with friends of mine 
because I, I was afraid to watch it alone because, you know, I'll jump off the balcony. And so <laughs> I'd be sitting there watching her, and she'd do something, you know, a gesture, and I'd say, I don't do that. And my friends, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> well, she did study hours and hours of the trial footage as well as, as finally meeting you. Um, how accurate was the FX series? So in general, in the big sense, it was. It put in the context of Rodney King as you have um, and showed that it was right. It's really fairly shortly thereafter. In the aftermath, we were living in it at the time. Um, it showed that very well. It also surprisingly addressed the issue of sexism, which no one had ever said a word about. And in those bigger, larger respects, they got it right. There, there were other things that were not right, which is bound to happen. They never claimed to be a documentary, so, you know. One of the, the, the interesting things that you mentioned to me when we talked for NBC is that in the, in the fictional series, the death penalty was on the table, and you told me... Never. It never was. It wasn't even discussed. The, the subject just never came up. Um, so I don't, I don't know why the writers thought they had to put that in, but it wasn't dramatic enough, you know? <laughs> just saying. Well, since we're there, and I mean... <laughs> Did you and Chris Darden have an affair? <laughs> wait, wait, you're supposed to ask me if we made out. <laughs> like Ellen. Did you, right. and, did, you and, uh, did, did you and Chris Darden make out? I, I, I'm going to take the fifth, as I always have. It's a long tradition that you're familiar with. <laughs> Watch the miniseries. <laughs> Um, I don't want to ruin it. I mean, in the end, O.J. Simpson is not convicted. I guess you know that. <laughs> um, and yet that last episode, in so many ways, was really an episode about you and about what you brought personally into that courtroom. And uh, it had to have been painful. Yeah. It was. It was, it, it was very hard to watch in general to be honest, you know, I mean, and, and hard to see uh, a lot of the things that were very true about, about the case and about the trial and the way things were handled, the circus of it, the insanity of it, a judge who was so besotted with celebrity that there was a constant stream of actors going in and out of chambers, which was unbelievable. Um, and, and a courtroom that was really literally out of control. So. And every day, going to court every day, knowing some bomb is going to explode, that Ito's not going to hold the line, he's not going to rule correctly. And it, to walk into court knowing that that's going to happen and watch justice be subverted every single day, I can't even tell you how painful it is. And watch everybody forget that two people are dead. So is your opinion that the defense w played outside the bounds? Mm -hmm. Or is your opinion that the, the judge failed to control the defense? Both. I mean, look, the defense, I never blame the defense. The defense is always going to push as hard as they can push. They're going to go for it in every way possible. It's up to the judge to hold the line, or at least sustain my objection. Um, but when, you, when he doesn't, when he actually lets them make up motions that never have existed, lets them bury the courtroom in nonsense and irrelevant you know, Colombian cartels, um, you know, things, go, things fly out of control, and it, it, it becomes a mess. That's why you need a judge. You need that referee he should hold their feet to the fire. So what happened to Lance Edo? I think, I think that this was... Was he a lousy judge, or was, was he overwhelmed by the circumstance? What's your... What's your no, I think he just was ill-suited to a celebrity trial, to a high-profile case, because he was so in love with the camera. I mean, he sat down for a six-part interview during the trial about his life. Well, who does this? You know? <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't get you to say good morning, so... Uh, <laughs> not you. I said good morning. Okay, oh maybe. God. Not much. <laughs> mm. um, I want to go back to the, I mean, this is an important topic, um, the judge's lack of control in the courtroom, but I also think it's important that we not lose the, the notion. In the last episode, I'm not sure that this happened the way it was portrayed, but in the last episode, Sarah Paulson playing you confesses to Chris Darden that she had been raped as a young woman. Yeah. Yeah. And why that played a role in, this, in the trial. You know, it, I, I have to say, it's interesting that they did that. Um, that really was fiction. Um, I was raped when I was a child, um, child, 17. Feels like a child now, though. Um, 
but um, it really didn't play a part in, at least not consciously, in terms of my identification with the victims. I just felt that way. It was never, I never made a connection in my mind between what happened to me and standing up for the victims. It was just important to stand up for the victims. And now, what do you think? Do you think that maybe it was, there was something there? Maybe there was. And, you know, it's possible. I wasn't thinking that at the time. But it, it was absolutely true um, that, that I, I couldn't bear the fact that I, was, I wanted to deliver the case for the victims. Um, I remembered the note that Nicole had written. He's OJ. He's, he's going to get away with it. He's going to kill me, and he's going to get away with it. And I so wanted to prove her wrong. And it was incredibly painful that I couldn't. Okay. Um, 21 years later, why are we still interested in this trial? I think because I've thought about that, because I have to tell you, when I first heard about the miniseries, I thought, no one's going to watch that. <laughs> I'm really good at this. <laughs> anyway. We're not hiring you for the head of programming, no. <laughs> yeah, I just blew that one. Um, but they did. And, and I think the reason is that the issues are still evergreen. You know, these issues are still very much in play. Um, the, the racism um, in America, the inequality when it comes to the treatment of minorities by law enforcement, this is still so much an issue. You uh, know better than anyone with all the footage that comes out constantly, um, you know, the dash cams and body cams and surveillance cameras showing shootings and showing beatings. And the, these, this keeps the issue very much alive. And it also explains why you get um, the, these kind of jury verdicts. You know, it's not the first time that um, you haven't seen it necessarily, not necessarily a public case, but um, a highly publicized case, but it happened many times that you would get a hung jury and it would hang along racial lines, or that you'd have to flat out acquittal. This is not the first one. And I think that that's still ongoing. And you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but I really felt that Trayvon Martin's case, uh, George Zimmerman should have been convicted. And you know, the, I had my issues with that, with that jury as well, and I had my beliefs about why it went the way it did. So, I think that we are not over it, and it's still very much in play, and so is sexism, and so is domestic violence, and then you know the notion of celebrity and the impact it has on the justice system. These are things that are still very much in play today. Yeah, it's as if there was a raw wound there that has yeah. never, that, that, that was created a long time ago and still is not healed. Yeah. You know, I loved, I want to see if I can find it. The New York Times, wrote a really, I thought, a very interesting piece. It says, for those too young to have watched the trial in real time, that's some of you, I see some young ones in the front row. <laughs> the story has a fuzzy, almost folkloric quality. A great football player might have stabbed two people to death. A jury decided otherwise. Kardashians are somehow involved. <laughs> Weird. But there is this kind of... <laughs> You know, <laughs> somebody asked me, so did you see that coming, the whole Kardashian thing? I said, How could I possibly see that coming? <laughs> I mean, it's the bizarro world. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> OK, so appreciating the context in which the trial took place and appreciating the judge's failure to control the courtroom in many regards, is there something looking back you feel you did wrong? Oh, yeah, of course. But I feel that way in every case. You know, I, I make mistakes in every case. I walk out every day. I should have objected to this. I shouldn't have objected to that. I could have done this. I should have said that. Always. Is there a big Always. one in the Simpson case? I, I have looked back endlessly. And certainly when I wrote the trial book, I cannot think of one thing I could have done differently that would have made a different verdict happen. OK, the gloves. Yeah. <laughs> I it was doesn't not in fit, favor. You must acquit. Yeah, yes, so this was not better. your trial strategy. No, no, it was the opposite of my trial strategy. That was a big fight that Chris and I had. Um, but ultimately, um, I did not convince him not to do it. Having said that, let me just say this. Everybody who asks me about the gloves says, "But, but you know, the latex is going to screw up the fit." But you know, it was frozen and it was unfrozen, and of course they shrunk because of all the mangling they did to test it. I mean, and he didn't want to make them fit. Yes, I know that. <laughs> but wait a minute, more importantly, so do you. And so did they. 
the and jury. Think, and the jury. And just in case you think they didn't know, I had an expert come on and testify to all of that. Not only did we do that, but we had an identical pair of gloves that had not been mangled and that he could wear without latex and put them on him, and they fit perfectly. The jury saw that. Oh, plus, did you introduce a receipt from Bloomingdale's? Nicole bought them for him. Yeah. So the jury the, I saw mean, the brand, the, the size, exactly. two years, I think. And they were a limited release. It was like only 300 pair made, you know, and she bought them for two pair for him. I mean, it was just, so, so when people point to the glove and say, oh, you know, that did it. No, it, but it didn't for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so are you interested in all these little details or am I just amusing myself? Okay, good, okay, good. We're gonna get to this book, but we can't really tell you much because it's fiction and we haven't read it yet. Okay, in a sec. <laughs> so Mark Furman, racist? Yeah. That was easy, next. <laughs> He was no fan of women either, so imagine. <laughs> I checked a lot of boxes for him. <laughs> so for those of you who have not brushed up on your OJ lately, remember this, it was a sort of, uh, it, was, it was F. Lee Bailey, had him on the stand and asked him if he had ever used the N-word. He asked him, actually that one I objected to. Yes. He asked him if he'd used it in the last 10 years. Yes. So here, you want the inside story about yes. that? Oh, right. So I, I don't want to get to too much minutia, so you guys just say stop it, okay? Um, so what happened was, Chris was preparing Mark Furman to testify. Yep. Because he was going to take him as the witness. And for, for reasons unknown, I wasn't there, I found out later, he took him to the grand jury room, which is a really imposing auditorium space where you have tiered seating going up and then you have the witness stand down here. And he had his law clerks and, and a couple of lawyers, of DAs, grilling him about using the N-word. And one of the questions they said, have you used it in the last 10 years? So for some reason, somehow, this is what happens when you have a big team, uh, that story got leaked, that he'd been grilling Mark Furman in the grand jury room, and that they'd asked him that question. And um, leaked, to I, who, leaked to the press. I don't remember this. Wow. I know, I know. And the thing is, I, I'm still not sure whether it went to the press or just the defense, but the defense found out about it. I was gonna say, I don't yeah. think it ever got printed. Yeah, wow. I, probably not, right? Um, but for Somebody sure the Google defense Somebody Google that, check it out. Yeah, okay. Check it out. Um, I do know that the defense knew though because F.E. Yeah. Bailey was He's dropping done. hints and telling me, you know, yeah, how about that grilling? What were you doing in the grand jury room? Blah, blah, blah. So somebody was leaking to him. Um, and I found out about that. So I knew that he knew that we'd asked Furman that question. If I object to that question, he's gonna say, well, <laughs> excuse me, Madam Prosecutor, but weren't you asking him that very question? And then we get into this whole thing about the grilling and the grand jury room, which I wanted to keep out. Um, so when he asked that question, I thought, this only leads down a really ugly path because it shows, it, it shows us basically grilling him in a way that looks like we think he could have planted the glove. It gets nastier and nastier. And for, I mean, the, the truth was that he had used the N-word yes, in the last 10 years. at least. Though he took the stand and said he had not. Right. And then he was impeached. Yes, predictably. With all of the incidences in which he had, in fact, yeah. used it. Yeah. I really, you so know. So how much did that hurt the case? I mean, obviously. Didn't help it any. Um, to be honest, you know, after Chris said, I'm not going to take the witness, you take him, um, I sat down with him, and he by then had a handler, Chuck Higby, who was a very... Do you know him? No, but that's interesting. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. He had a handler who was helping him because he was a nervous wreck. He was a mess. And um, Chuck was taking him in and out of the courthouse, and he was a big bear of a guy. You may have seen him. Yeah, I yeah, saw him. you did. And he was, but a very gentle guy, very calming influence. And I started to ask Mark, you know, look, this business about I haven't, you got to, you know, that can't be right. It can't be right. And um, he said, and he got froze up, you know, it is right. And Chuck Higby, come here, pulls me out of the room. And he says, he's gonna fall apart. You can't do this, you can't push him on this anymore. That's his answer, that's his answer, that's all he can say, he's on the edge, don't do this, just let it go. And because that's all he's gonna tell you. And I, <laughs> great, perfect. Well that worked out really well. Yeah, yeah you really did, yeah. Um, One of the things that I learned from watching the FX was just how 
unaware I was at the time of the way you were treated in comparison to the way the male lawyers were treated. Oh. And I was sort of shocked at myself that I was not more aware of it at the time. For those people who yeah. aren't, aren't thinking about this, fill them in. Yeah, it was, it was a, this, so this was the amazing part of the miniseries because no one really ever talked about it. And neither did we. No. You know, women in the 90s doing a man's job. Had to be tough. Had to be tough. And if you call sexism, you're a lame excuse for a whiner. You know, and that's really, it's all about your weakness. You can't take it. You can't take the heat, so get out of the kitchen kind of thing. So I never complained. But it was a constant, and it was a very upsetting constant, because whatever would happen without a jury, I don't care. Call me whatever you want to call me. But when you do it in front of a jury, they take their cue from you. So it would be Mr. Cochran, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Darden, Marsha. And then it would be harsh criticism. I mean, he would actually yell, you know, sustain, you know, whenever he was talking to me. And the men got away with everything, particularly the defense. Even when Shapiro stood up and called the judge to his face, called him disingenuous, nothing. I mean, for most judges, that's contempt time you're talking about. And there were also these subtle, I mean, not so subtle, but at the time, these digs. Yes. Oh, well, if we'll have the hearing of Ms. Ms. Clark can arrange her child care. Yeah, that was Johnny, actually, yeah. Um, and then um, I got up and talked about child care being an issue for some of us. Um, some of us do have to work and some of us do have children, Mr. Cochran, probably not your problem, but you know, he don't have to worry about it. That doesn't mean some of us don't. And that was, they showed that in the FX series. Um, and that was true. That was true. So, what was it? Johnny Cochran, mm -hmm. good guy, bad guy? <laughs> he really, really, he really meant it. Here's the thing. I mean, I always got along with Johnny. He was, he, to me, he was never my issue. My issue was with the judge. I expected him to do pretty much what he did do. And he could push, he kept pushing it as far as he could. I, that's totally to be expected. But with Johnny in particular, the issue of civil rights, the issue of the uh, mistreatment of Amer African Americans in the criminal justice system was a, a true issue, keenly felt by him, very much believed in. Um, he wasn't kidding, you know what I mean? No, I don't think it was appropriate to put it on Simpson. His Simpson was, should not have been the recipient of that, in my opinion, because he was not someone who had been mistreated in the least. But, but for Johnny, it was a larger issue. It was, it was all about that message, always about that message. And he meant it. So it was, it was for real, you know what I mean? It wasn't just a disingenuous, manipulating defense lawyer. There was a real there there. Would you call any of the other lawyers manipulating defense lawyers? Sure. Oh, sure, absolutely. Which ones? Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, I, mean, I mean, I think Carl Douglas felt as, um, as Johnny did. But, um, no, the rest of Robert them, Shapiro? Absolutely. Yes, I mean, there was, there, to me, he's an example of no there there. Um, he was the one who actually started the, the ball rolling with, he was the one who invented that ridiculous story about Furman planting the glove. That came from him. And then he did nothing but try and back away from it, but no, that was him. And I do not believe that he, in per he personally has any great beliefs regarding civil rights or you know, anything like that. I think for him it was all about I'm gonna win this case and manipulate the jury any way I can. I'm not saying that, that defense attorneys don't routinely, we all manipulate juries. I mean, to a certain extent, it's the job. Um, but to do it unfairly based on the prejudice and bias, that's a whole different story. Well, you wanted to know and she told you. <laughs> uh, I think we ought to do a minute on the book before we take some questions. I don't know if any of you have any questions. Um, I think they've circulated. You write as a defense lawyer. How did that happen? <laughs> so what most people don't know is I was a criminal defense lawyer before I became a prosecutor. And now I'm defending again, um, handling criminal appeals, court-appointed cases for the indigent. So I wanted to write from the other side of the courtroom because it's, it's so much fun. There's no burden of proof. All you're doing is taking shots at the prosecution's case. You know, <laughs> you get to you run around, and you know, clients are all def you know, they're criminals. They're very colorful. It's fun. And, uh, <laughs> I 
it's true. And so and you I make more I, money. And yeah, well, you could. You could. She doesn't. She doesn't. No. <laughs> but she, what she is, is she's a, a fairly twisted, kind of traumatized person, but a very tough cookie, who is out to win at all costs, all the time. But in the meantime, um, is very, very smart. But what's great with somebody like that, they have no limits. So there's, you can push her all over the place. She's naturally in danger because her clients are dangerous. So um, I'm having a lot great, of fun. I mean, honestly, I'm not just saying this because she's sitting here, although I'm slightly afraid of her, so I would, but <laughs> no. I'm not at all, and it, the book is fabulous, so grab it on the way out. These are really good questions, so let's try to power through them and so you can all go have dinner. Do you have any confidence in our court system? I do. I do. Here's why. I mean, more often than not, the juries get it right. And especially now that I'm handling cases on appeal, I've handled thousands at this point in the last 10 years, and up and down the state of California, you know, a huge swath. And I'd say at least 85 to 90 percent of the time, they get it right, surprisingly. So on the flip side, a twofer here, a good question. What do you think happened to cause OJ to kill those two people? Oh, that's, I really believe that it, this is a classic domestic violence killing. Um, this was, as Gavin De Becker put it, Nicole was in the wrong place for a long time, and Ron was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, she was the last, it, it was the last straw for him. She had finally dissed him that night, and he had lost Paula Barbieri, and he couldn't find any other women, and he was in that mode of building, building, building all day, because when I could finally get Cato to tell the truth, he described someone who was in very bad shape that day and behaving very strangely, trying to set up an alibi with going out to get burgers, and then Cato went with him. Anyway, bottom line is, I think he finally just couldn't take it anymore. He blamed her for everything that was going wrong in his life. Rage? Rage. And did he really forget what he did? Or, I mean, had he persuaded himself? I mean, there were many theories. One is that he persuaded himself that, that, that he was justified. Another was that he sort of blacked out. What, what do you think? I think he, if he follows the classic domestic violence psyche, um, he believes it was justified. She had it coming. And Ron, it was just a, he was expendable. As someone who has prosecuted many murder cases, do you favor the death penalty? Oh, no. <laughs> that is way, I'm going to, I'm going to, in California in particular, I have to say no because we really don't have one. What we do is pour tons of money into the handling of those cases and the taxpayer dollars go out the window and, mm -hmm. and they're sitting there. And so why don't we just be honest about it and say we don't have a death penalty and just lock them up? It would save a lot of money. <laughs> Um, I'm a young female prosecutor. Any advice for success? You have the best job. You do. You have the best job. There's no greater job satisfaction, I think, than being a prosecutor. I loved it. I got up every day to fight for the victims, and I really, you know, there, there's a satisfaction you get from that that's unparalleled. And I would just say, um, enjoy it. Love it. Um, I, and my advice to, to the young people always is the same. The one thing that I can say when you ask me, you know, regrets about the trial, the reason I really don't have them is because, of course, I made mistakes, but I gave it my all. I gave it 110%. I left nothing on the table. Flawed as I was, you know, I did all that I could, and I dragged myself out of there every day oh. and in. Thank you. But, that's, but that's my advice to the young ones, you know, whatever you do, Give it your all. Give it 110%, and then you won't have regrets. I think it's, it, it is heartbreaking, though, that you left the profession. Yeah, but it worked but out. Because <laughs> really, that was my childhood dream. My childhood dream was to write crime fiction. I loved crime from the time I was a little tiny kid, and it was really weird and gross. And I, <laughs> and I wanted to write crime stories, so I kind of got to go full circle. It worked out. Okay, well, so that's how. All right, in the OJ case, was Jason Simpson ever investigated as a suspect? Good question. He was, and he was eliminated. But um, he was investigated, actually, before we got the DNA results in, because if we'd gotten those back, we wouldn't have needed to. But they investigated and found not only that he wasn't there um, and that he was at work, but also that he loved Nicole. By all accounts, they were very close. So there was no... There was no, there was nothing there. This, no, this, new, this theory that's been floating around has been floating around for 15 years. It's been BS the whole time, still is. Um, everything at the crime scene excludes him, so. Is there any doubt in your mind that O.J. Simpson was the single killer? None, zero, zip. <laughs> it sounds as if you were very passionate about the law. How long did it take you to recover? 
Ooh, a really long time. A really long time. You know what, because I wasn't sure exactly when I finally did recover. Maybe I still haven't. You know, I, I don't know, really, because the fact that the miniseries, when it came out, still upset me so much and was still so painful to watch, I mean, if I'd recovered, maybe it wouldn't be. We should also mention there's the, doc I have not seen the SPN oh documentary. God, right. Eight yes. hours, um, have you, have, you were interviewed it. for it, I know. Yeah, and I've seen it. And? It's phenomenal, phenomenal, you have to see it. It's, it's about more than just a trial, it's about race in America, but seen through the prism of Simpson's life. And it's, it's fascinating and it's so profound. And it'll, I think it'll tell, you, it'll tell you better than I ever could, although I always try to tell you the odds that we were up against. That will tell you for sure, that graphically tells you what was the temperature in Los Angeles at the time, what it was like. It really, yeah. Two more questions. Okay, by me. Okay, two more questions, okay. Robert Shapiro, oh no, this is, well actually Robert Shapiro, the writer says, went on to start the Innocence Project. Actually that was Barry, Barry Schacht, Schacht, who had already started it before the trial. Right. Um, what are your thoughts about DNA evidence in, and the Innocence Project? Well, I'm gonna tell him what I told you. I, I've sent my clients to the Innocence Project. <laughs> when, when the legal system, what I do is review for legal errors. I don't go back and reinvestigate a case. That's not what the court appoints me to do. And so if I, see, if I see a client where it seems that DNA testing might help them, I refer them to the Innocence Project, and I have done for a few of them, you know, whenever it's appropriate. So I think the Innocence Project is wonderful, and I think that DNA is um, handled appropriately, is, is a terrific tool, and only getting better and better. And so what about um, Barry Schecht in the Simpson trial? He did a lot to dismantle your DNA evidence. He did, um, and I, it, was, it was such bullshit. <laughs> and you can quote her on that one. <laughs> I mean, oh God, the New York Times is here. Who cares? Oh God. <laughs> well, they probably won't print that. <laughs> right. um, okay. Final question, and I have to just say in advance, you are a fabulous person to talk to, and I know our audience will agree with that. Thank you. Can I say likewise? Likewise. She makes it look easy. Yeah, she well, makes it look easy. It is easy. <laughs> Talking to you. Okay, this is a really good question, too. I, I said the, the why audiences are the smartest audiences yeah. anywhere. Even though OJ was acquitted in your trial, he was eventually convicted in the later unrelated case where he's still doing hard time. Do you feel that the publicity of your trial led to this? And if so, did you lose the battle but win, win the war? war? You know, I have to say, um, you never know what impacts people. I mean, certainly people knew the, about the verdict there, but I did cover the case um, for, for yeah. that hard-hitting news agency, Entertainment Tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Stay out of my lane, sister. <laughs> yeah. No, I did. I did. I stayed very far out of your lane because <laughs> they always wanted to know. I come out to talk about the legal thing, and they say, "Well, no. What was he wearing?" Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. But. Um, <laughs> I talked to the bailiffs and I said, you know, what do you think about these juries? What is it? Right. It's, it's, are, these juries are hammers, so he's he's in trouble. But also, um, the crime was caught on videotape, so I don't know. It was a pretty good case, <laughs> you know. He was going to get convicted. Um, the but sentences... in terms of cosmic justice, oh, that's a different story. That's maybe, maybe. You know, it would be nice to believe in karma, right? Wouldn't it be nice to think that? The, the universe has a way of making things balance out. I, he was I don't also think convicted in the civil proceeding, which followed right. the cr criminal right. trial. That's right. Well, and so the irony is that the property that he went to take back in Las Vegas, his big thing was some sports memorabilia dealers were selling stuff that he considered to be his stuff, but it wasn't. That was the stuff, the property that should have gone to the Goldmans. After, yeah. And he squirreled it away after the civil verdict. He hid a whole bunch of stuff in storage lockers. And I think agents got a hold of it, and it got sold off, and that's how it wound up in Las Vegas. And the reason he got 33 years was he went in with a gun? Gun, yeah. To get I it think, back. Yeah, to get it back. Two guys had guns. I think he was not armed, but his cohorts were. And it was like, what are you dreaming? I mean, anyway. <laughs> Words fail me. So. I'm going to give you the final and last word. When you sit down to write a book like this, how much of this is your real lived experience? And how much of this are you making up out of whole cloth? Because some really scary things happening here. You know, it's hard for me to know how much, you know, some of it, sir, 
certainly fiction, of course. And usually that transpires in the course of the case itself. I make the case more complex, certainly um, more dramatic than the average case. But I've had a lot of dramatic cases, and I've known a lot of interesting people, and weird people, and dangerous people. So I have to say, <laughs> a lot of my life experiences wind up in the book, one way or another, whether I want to or not. I think they wind up there, so. Well, go inside the mind of Marsha Clark by the book. <laughs> thank you all for being here. And Marsha, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're wonderful. Thank you.